Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Word on the Snakevine. I'm your host Ross Deacon and in, the, in this podcast we talk all about things venomous animal related. From venom research, venomous animal husbandry, animal conservation, herping and of course snake bite and snake bite initiatives from all around this world. On this episode I've joining me as my co-host. Hi I'm Ed and before we start I have to do a few formalities. Any views expressed in this episode are the views of the guests and the hosts, not the facilities or company they work for. And today we have Professor Anna Nakaris from the Little Fireface, Little Fireface Project and also Oxford Brookes University as a Professor of Anthropology. How are you today, Professor? Doing fine. Thank you for inviting me. It's honestly a, a pleasure. This is actually the first time that we've done anything outside of reptiles on the podcast and I think uh, what a great place to start with a venomous primate I think it's uh, such a an unusual and uh, diverse set of species I think uh, our listeners are really going to enjoy listening to the information that, that you can share with us so I think the first place to the first place to start is kind of uh, how did the little fireface the little fireface project start and kind of um, what was the main reason behind it and how how come Oxford Brookes University kind of helped support you to to start that project so I've been studying lorises since the early 90s I started with another type of loris called slender loris and I was working with the nocturnal primate research group at Oxford Brookes University so I started working there after my PhD in 2000 as a like a researcher for the nocturnal primate research group. And we were working on bush babies and potos and night monkeys, so all the different nocturnal primates. And um, slowly over time, uh, I was developing more and more work on the slow loris in a long-term project of the slow loris. And back in about 2010, I got asked by the BBC uh, to make a, a natural world documentary. And we went to Indonesia and we ended up filming a documentary specifically about the venom of the slow loris. So it was a research project I had just been funded to do by the Leverhulme Trust. And the the BBC was really, really interested in the fact that lorises are venomous. But at the same time, they're one of the most traded mammal species, and they're one of the most common protected species in markets. So when that film went out, the producer of The Natural World said, you know, thousands of people are going to watch this, and they're going to want to know what they can do to help. Uh, the slow loris because as much as venom was the hook to get people to watch the you know devastating trade of the slow loris was the really important part so the university at that point had a call for charities uh they were going to support three lecturers in the university to have a charity and i put in for the call uh, and i got it the month before the film aired and the day the film aired i received ten thousand emails uh, so it was exciting to then have that platform to be able to help help people to help, I guess. That's that's kind of that's that's great, and obviously that can lead um, has helped you expand the project, and kind of make the project bigger into into what it is today. And and I think if if people have seen you talk uh, or or seen other members of the uh, of the little fireface project talk, kind of you can see that it's a big operation, and kind of quite a few different things have come out of that. Yeah, and, and so you'd think it's big, but it's actually a very, very small team. We're just all very passionate. We ended up calling it Little Fireface because it's a Sundanese word, the local word for slow loris. But also we are interested in all the nocturnal species that are occurring in our area. So it actually is nicer than being the slow loris project because we could study civets or owls or I don't know frogs, all sorts of nocturnal animals. And, and that's what we do. We're working on different taxa in the area. We're working on conservation education. We're, right now, our big project is working with farmers to help them to be certified what's called wildlife friendly. So they can sell coffee, organic wildlife friendly coffee, hopefully in the UK very soon. And that will help all of the animals living on their farms uh, to have a long-term habitat because island, the, the island of Java only has 10% of forest left and slow lorises uh, don't really live in the forest that's left. So they're relying totally on local people. So that kind of work is really important and integrated into what Little Fireface Project does. I think that's something that we're going to talk about um, a little bit later on as well, about about the, the kind of the, how the locals interact with the different projects and stuff that you've got, obviously. Uh, and, I, and we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail. You've already mentioned you worked with um, 
was it slender loris as you said first yep have you diverse i'm like um i'm not an expert on lorises i i stick with snakes normally um there's been some recent discoveries of new species i believe has that affected your work or are you focused only on slow lorises at the moment well, for the venom aspect so i'm um it's it's interesting. A lot of people are are interested in kind of one topic, and then they focus on that topic, maybe with many different taxa. For me, I focus kind of on lorises, but then I focus on many many different topics. And one of those topics is taxonomy and their conservation, because I've uh, been invited to write the IUCN red lists for slow and slender lorises. But in back in two thousand six, during the first time I went to one of those meetings, we didn't even know how many species there were. We know that when Lorises were first discovered in the 18th century and described throughout the 19th and early 20th century, they were much more diverse than they are today. And other species of primates in particular that were discovered and described at the same time, they, they occur all the way from India to the Philippines. And we had one slow loris and like 25 gibbons, which are small apes, or one slow loris and 25 macaques, the monkeys you see in labs all the time. And a loris can't jump or leap, so it was crazy there could only be one loris when there was so many of all these other things. So slowly we are kind of re-elevating old taxa that were described in the early 1900s, but also so far we've discovered two new ones. Um, that's that's really quite interesting because um, I think I read on your website that there was um, that there's in total with the re-elevation and the two new ones, there's the seven in total that have become new species. So, yeah, seven that are new. So there's nine altogether now. Yeah, which is which is quite interesting. And as you say, it kind of makes sense that if they over such a a vast set of um, of different climates and microclimates and and stuff that they wouldn't necessarily all be the same species. So it's quite interesting to see that that actually some of the work that you guys are doing is is helping to elevate those species and and create new ones where where necessary, which is which is rather interesting. So some of the extra other work that the project does is that you go into rescue and rehabilitation work of lorises as well within Java. Um, I was just wondering, kind of, how does that work? Kind of, do you relo do you uh, relocate? How do you relocate them? Um, are they re-released, or are some have to be kept in captivity uh, for research and, and bits and pieces like that? Really, it's actually very complex. It's not even just in Java; it's throughout the range of slow lorises. So one of the important jobs I have is if someone rescues the loris, I tell them what species they have, uh, because often they release the wrong species even into the wrong country. Um, sometimes we have to see what age it is. For example, they are difficult to even sex because males and females look very similar. Females have kind of emasculated sexual organs, so people get them wrong all the time. Um, and then, so once we know what the animal is, then we decide if it can be released. So in general, you shouldn't release a species in a country where you don't know its distribution or its behavior has never been studied. But with a lot of small nocturnal mammals, people don't care and they release them left, right, and center without any sort of studies. We also have a conflict where lorises do really well in human modified habitats, but they don't do very well in secondary forest. Um, and a lot of the forest that's left is this like kind of late stage secondary growth, which doesn't have the plants and habitat lorises need which is more like a tree fall zone, so rubbishy, heavily connected plants, which is why they often do well in human habitations. Um, and so people will find a loris in their garden and they quote unquote rescue it to put it in the forest where there's no food for it and it dies. So it's like taking a squirrel out of your garden and putting it in some random forest, thinking it'll be fine. So that's, a, that's another major job we have is trying to get people to leave lorises where they are. We deal with huge confiscations. Sometimes 100 or 200 animals are confiscated at once. Um, this is where venom comes in because they're packed into boxes and they bite each other. And in the past, people would say they'd get a loris in a rescue center and within a week it was dead. And they'd get another kind of primate and within a week it was, within a week it was fine and releasable. So these venomous bites are really horrendous in captivity. So giving people advice on how to um, cure those animals or how to help them heal, how to house them socially, Finally, because lorises are venomous, another big problem they have is their teeth are clipped out because a lot of the trade is for the pet trade. And people say if you clip the loris's teeth, A, it won't, bet, won't bite the new owner, 
but also B, they don't bite each other when they're smashed into cages uh, because a bitten up Loris gets necrotic, disgusting bites and it's not saleable. So, of course, you can never release Lorises without teeth. So it's been a big problem, A, having rescue centers full of Lorises without teeth, but also some rescue centers think it's still okay to release those animals, and then they just end up starving to death, which is even probably a worse way to die. So we do a lot of education. We make a lot of... Um, we actually do the releases ourselves. We monitor releases. I'm working with rescue centers in Thailand, Cambodia, Singapore, um, India, etc., giving advice and uh, making identification keys for the species, all sorts of things. So yeah, it's a very complex issue for slow horses. Well, that's what, one thing that you said there that was that I found very interesting is that we know with reptiles, if they are relocated within so many uh, kilometers, over so many kilometers from where they are picked up, um, they're being rescued from. That actually, it's detrimental to their to their health because of their native home ranges. However, with with lorises, is that is that something similar? Do you actually find that if they are relocated from one uh, one island to another in Indonesia or the Philippines or something, that actually you find that um, they just don't have the coping mechanisms to be able to to live within that environment, that change of environment? Um, that's completely correct. It's not even moving to another island. It's this idea, for example, of rescuing an animal, saying we're going to release it to this protected area, this forest. But most animals are actually caught around farmlands because it's easy to catch them there. And so this loris has never seen a forest in its life. It has no idea what to eat. Often the forests in Java, for example, they're very high altitude, so they're very, very cold. So some of the animals freeze to death. And one of the first studies we did on Java was monitoring release. And we would release the animals in this lovely, beautiful, protected forest. They would run down the mountain until they got to like a chili field or, or a tomato field or something where they were happy. And the, the group that was doing the release would pick them up and put them back in the forest again. And essentially, they, they call that homing instinct and in reintroduction and release, that the animal has like a mental template and a knowledge of what its home habitat is. So it's going to do post-release -dispers post dispersal looking for that habitat. And that's common across a huge number of species. And that's why it's so important to do surveys and know like where the animals came from. And if you recognize that's happening, then you might have to accept that the habitat where you're releasing the animal is not suitable. When you're undertaking these studies, do you get uh, do you work alongside a lot of the, the local population to use their their knowledge on the species and the land? Um, and would you typically go for a certain demographic of uh, the population, like for example, someone who hunts um, native wildlife? Are they more useful to get information about the lorises than, um, for example, farmers who see them regularly around their field? Oh gosh, they, we ask, we do a lot of work with, with local people, but at different levels. So for example, hunters tend to know areas where you find animals. So Java and Slow Loris, the one we're working on now, it's critically endangered. And we found the place where we're studying them now through a hunter who because you know, we were originally looking in forests, thinking, oh, they should be in protected areas, but we didn't see any protected areas or extremely low densities. And it turned out the minute we were going into these places where hunters were working, which were essentially the equivalent of British hedgerows, um, then you can see 30 lorises in a night sometimes. And uh, it's, it's incredible the density they can be in, in a habitat that you wouldn't expect a primate to live in. And that absolutely was down to local knowledge. We also did a lot of uh, interviews with local people about their bites and the impact of their bites and their perceptions of why they're venomous. And that was that could have been anyone. But I have to say it is a lot of farmers because when farmers are cutting habitat, they're likely to come into contact with the loris. So they might have seen them more than anybody else. And then we also interview people about the pet trade, like why they want to have them as pets and how we might be able to change attitudes to get people to want something else as a pet that's not a critically endangered exotic species. So that would be more teenage to 25 year old women who are the big pet people that want pets the most. Do you find that with the pet trade, it, it's more in Asia or are we in the or do you see them quite often in the Western world as well? Interestingly, um, back in 2009, uh, the first slow loris pet video went viral 
And after that, the pet trade boomed in slow lorises. So there are certain countries that are hot spots for slow loris trade. Uh, Russia, Czech Republic, Japan, um, some countries in the Middle East is where we get a huge number of lorises being smuggled. And therefore, sometimes also going into zoos and rescue centers. But, uh, oh gosh, on a weekly basis, I get an email from an, a private pet owner from one of those countries who's asking me how to keep their loris alive because something's horrendously wrong with it. So, yeah, definitely there is a prevalent pet trade within Asia, particularly countries like Thailand, Korea, Indonesia, Singapore a bit, um, because in other parts of Asia, lorises are more used for traditional medicines and less for pets. And they have over 100 uses in traditional medicine. So um, they are annihilated on all fronts. But then we also get places like Thailand, where you have beaches, where Western people who've seen a cute video get a photograph taken with a slow loris. So that, that's the only, to be honest, that is the only place I've seen a slow loris is in Thailand too. Um, that was the only place that I, I've ever seen one in, in real life. It's also now happening in Turkey. So if you go to Mamaris Beach in Turkey, you can also have a nice photo taken with a slow loris. I, I, I would uh, assume that those those uh, lorises have had their teeth clipped and bits and pieces as well um, for them to not bite or not be able to inflict, inflict major injury to the to the people that are having their picture taken with it. So it's animal exploitation in, and animal cruelty in, in various guises all in one. And it's also illegal, so it's just frankly illegal in the first place. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, it's incredible how many people still want to put those pictures on Instagram or whatever. And you see, like, I know it's wrong, but I thought I'd leave this picture up of me in my bikini with a slow loris to inform people. And, uh, and then they have thousands of likes on what a great person they are, that they're informing people about the trade, even though they still have this photograph of them doing something illegal. And it's uh, something else we've been doing a lot of work with is monitoring those sort of posts and trying to change behavior. And interestingly, um, even on Instagram, which is a big place for those sort of photographs, there is now a warning hashtag of slow loris or slow loris self. But it is only in English. So we did a study looking at um, all the other major European languages. And we looked at the comments and the dialogues of the, the English posts where people said, did you know it's in danger? Did you know it's illegal? It's really wrong. You're doing that. Whereas in German and Portuguese and Spanish and Italian, it's still, it's so cute. I want one. Where can I get one? So that's interesting how the different languages all need their own outreach and awareness. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's uh, that, that's something that's quite going to be quite vital moving forward uh, within with that kind of part of the trade. And, and kind of, I know I'm skipping a bit forward to a bit further down the agenda, but as you say that it is illegal and these animals are CITES based, are, are CITES animals. So kind of, with the um, the legalities of it all, kind of, how does that affect your research? So one of the number one questions that I get is, what is in slow loris's venom? What what is the biomechanical <laughs> properties? And it's almost impossible to export samples. I was actually the chief scientist involved with the transfer of slow loris society's appendix one, and I remember like the first thing when I was asked about it. I know that actually being society's appendix one doesn't protect the species in the country. And although there is a there is an export of these animals, most of the trade, as we just said earlier, is, is in situ, is in the country. So I knew it wouldn't actually have that big of an effect. And sometimes it has a negative effect. The species gets more expensive and more desirable because it's perceived as more rare. But I also remember thinking, I'll never be able to export a sample ever again. And so when we did our big venom project, like the where we, we heavily collected venom, we managed to get export permits but it was about three years after the initial sample collection. And these are highly volatile samples. So the samples that ended up in the, the lab of my colleague, a guy, I'm sure you know, Brian Fry in Australia, yep. they were very heavily degraded. They'd been frozen and unfrozen. And in the end, we got very limited information out of those samples. And um, even getting them traveling from a train from our field site to the university where we work, we need all of these insane internal export like, transfer permits. So it's very, very, very difficult. And it's kind of depressing because as you're, ooh, uh, sorry, my, my computer went out. Uh, it's a bit depressing because as you are taking your samples on the train, you pass about 50 illegal animal markets selling animals. 
and they have no permits. Nobody's arresting them. But you can't just have like a saliva sample and, and bring it down eight hours on a train to a university. So is that one of the reasons why you looked at using captive populations of loris for the uh, for the initial samples of the venom? Um, yes, and we're still doing that for certain aspects because there's a lot of questions we want to be able to answer. And we were hoping if we got a good technique done, say in the UK on captive samples, we could train someone in Indonesia to do that same research there um, and be able to get some of the answers that we haven't been able to get by not being able to export. But the difference is, I mean, I, I, what we seem to know anyway is that these guys are venomous, whether they're in, born in captivity or whether they're born in the wild. But their diet in the wild is so dramatically different. I always felt, and also the Javan slow loris does not occur in captivity here in the UK as well. Um, but I oh, still have a feeling that something about their wild diet is affecting something. They have a, quite a crazy diet. So I would just as, assume it affects something about the chemical composition of especially the saliva, if not the brachial oil, which is the other part of their venom. So you, you met, just mentioned about their diet, and that kind of moves us on to uh, kind of you saying that 10% of the Javan forest has, has disappeared, uh, is, only, is left, sorry. Yeah. Um, so kind of what is the effects of global warming and on their diet and kind of because obviously global warming is is quite critical on on insects and stuff uh, more so which is then having an impact on on mammalian prey on, on mammalian items as well so kind of how is climate change affecting the lorises in in java um well it's not just climate change it's also good dramatic deforestation but one weird thing about lorises is, is they can go into torpor and they can go into multi-day torpor, which is a kind of hibernation. And so the colder it gets, actually like them having to deal with colder habitats. And the other interesting thing is so much deforestation has occurred in the lowland forests. They're being pushed higher up mountains to higher altitudes, which is very cold. Um, so they're, it's an interesting combination of, they have to be more energetic so they don't go into torpor. And they have to eat more to keep themselves moving. So so I, actually we see them being a lot more active in the cold temperatures, although you'd expect them to go straight into torpor. They have to eat a lot more food and be a lot more active to keep themselves from going into torpor. Um, so that's important. Also, we know that another food they eat is nectar. And nectar is heavily influenced by temperature. So the, if it gets colder or warmer, it could improve. Warmer temperatures improve the nectar and colder makes it less energy, energetic, and full of sugars and things. So that's another major food that's affected by global temperature change for lorises. Um, we also know in other parts of their range, they're actually extinct in some areas now. So in major parts of China, they're now extinct, where there's been temperature change, parts of Vietnam and parts of Cambodia as well. So um, I think some, some of the places where they're occurring, the habitat is just no longer suitable for them, which is a big problem. That, that's quite interesting, especially the, the bit about China, because um, our, our next guest is actually coming on to talk about conservation efforts in China. Um, so it'd be quite interesting that you've said that and to see kind of of where he, he goes with how conservation efforts are affecting certain species. And uh, we now know that we can we can ask him about about lorises within that area and see see if there is any anything that he knows of that's going on, on in that area. So that, that's actually uh, quite interesting. So with the um, with with the the forest destruction, you're saying you're seeing them kind of go more towards uh, townships and uh, human settlements, and that obviously that that's probably creating, as you say, is creating this rescue conflict where actually people need to leave these the, the slow lorises where they are, and they'll probably be okay and live within live within the township. But does that create a conflict where you're seeing people being bitten while and being mauled while uh, trying to relocate relocate the lorises and such forth. Um, sometimes, so for example, if if someone's cutting some bamboo and a, and they catch a loris, uh, they may get bitten, and they they're very aware of the venomous bite of the slow loris. They say that loris bites are worse than a snake. They say loris bites are worse than some cats, like big cats, uh, and they say one of the problems of the loris bite is there's no cure. So they know to avoid it. They also have a lot of myths about loris. Like, so for example, I think what's happened in the past is they might be cutting with a machete and they 
they slash a loris and it bleeds. So they say if you catch a loris and a single drop of blood from the loris falls on the ground, nothing will ever grow there again. You'll have landslides. So in that sense, there's a lot of negative perceptions of lorises where they might be moved or killed on site in some parts of their range. And you could go about 100 kilometers west and they'll say, oh, a loris waits for you at the gates of the afterlife. Never touch it, never hurt it. So you have one area where it's got a lot of negative beliefs and another area where it has pretty spiritual beliefs. Um, and so depending on where you're working, people coming into contact will be different. So yeah. Yes, it's a very complex issue. You mentioned um, having trouble getting saliva samples out effectively to get uh, looked at, and you mentioned sending some to uh, Brian Red Fry. Did you manage to find um, any kind of abundance of components within the, the saliva that you didn't find in the, uh, the brachial oils or vice versa, um, and how it how those components work to to, to create this the loris's venom? So I can talk about this a little bit more from what the the effect of the, the both of them. I know that Brian had a master student look at the saliva separately, and I also had Steve Trim from Venom Tech looking at the saliva. And there are certain components of the saliva which are associated with causing pain. And so we know that if you're bitten by a loris just with the saliva alone, it causes intense pain, and also it can cause severe necrosis. But if you're bitten with the saliva and the brachial oil combined, or not you, but if another animal is. So for example, we did a lot of experiments with um, potential loris prey in terms of um, a wide range of insects. And a colleague of mine as well inje injected the venom into mice. And only when the brachial exudate is combined with the saliva does it have a fatal effect on insects and mice so the um, saliva alone does nothing and the brachial oil alone does nothing only when it's combined it has the fatal effects and that's also what causes the anaphylactic shock in humans whereas the saliva alone just causes extreme pain and necrosis that's actually quite interesting that you say that uh, it can uh, it has a fatal effect on on rodent prey. Would they would they nat lorises naturally eat rodent prey if they were able to catch it in the wild? I've never seen a loris eat a rodent, but I've seen them eat plenty of bats, uh, geckos, and lizards and snakes. So um, they're 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 um <laughs> their diet is very diverse. Um, and that, that's, uh, and I, I know we always underestimate that being animal prey because it's a lot harder to see at night, whereas when they eat tree gum or nectar, it's, they, they're there for a long time, so it's easy to see that. But when we collect the fecal samples, they, it's evident how much um, invertebrate and vertebrate prey they're eating. The vertebrate prey, I'm certain, they eat birds as well. The difference is what we, what we looked at, we did some tests in captivity because, of course, some other mammals, the selenodon, the Eurasian water shrew and the European water shrew, they use their venom to uh, essentially paralyze prey and even to cache prey for later consumption. And so we expected if lorises were doing that, they would bite into sort of the spinal cord of the, of the victim and it would stop its struggle and they could eat it more slowly or they could save it or they could bring it and give it to their kid or something because they're social primates. Instead, when they eat, eat those things, <laughs> Um, they just bite their head off and then like suck their neck like a lollipop. So there's wow. never a connection in the animal flops. They're just decapitating. They're total decapitators. So, they love biting heads off things. So they're um, they're not even using their venom in that case. They're just ripping heads off. <laughs> yeah, and, but we did find though. However, you rarely, rarely, ever, ever, ever see a loris with a single ectoparasite. So I feel like the way, way that that venom is killing. Um, is killing insects, etc. Especially insects, because it, it kills insects of all shapes and sizes. Is um, I think it, the loris is going to torpor, right? So they're sleeping for hours, and um, they can be sleeping solitary, so they don't have someone grooming them and cleaning their fur all the time. So it's a very efficient system to keep your fur beautifully parasite free. And um, yeah, so that it, it, and it's something that what other primates do a bit as well. They use 
uh, topical ointments to put on their fur to stay parasite free. And the other thing lorises don't do, they don't sleep in nests. So a lot of animals that are parasite free are lining their nests with some sort of like a, a medicinal or a plant with properties to keep away parasites. And so since lorises don't do that, having your own kind of parasitic property in your saliva mixed with your brachial oil would be great. And also the other thing is you have a lot of time if you're self-grooming to mix brachial oil and saliva, whereas when you're attacked, you don't have as much time to combine the two of them. But it's just what we've seen, you know, like, so it's, 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 we have evidence for it, but this is where we need all of these nice chemical studies to know exactly what's in the saliva and exactly what's in the brachial oil during the different months of the year and how it changes. And yeah, and, and I, I'm always asking if anyone would like to travel to Indonesia, um, I, a few of the Venom days I've attended, I've offered fully funded trips to hang out in a lab and do all this study for me because I'm an ecologist. I'm not a biochemist. <laughs> I'll throw that out to your listeners if someone wants to go. Uh, well, that is a question for later on uh, to, to be able to get a little bit more information on how they can get involved in the little fire face project. <laughs> but kind of that leads us on to the Venom Day talk, um, onto your Venom Day talk that you spoke about that they actually, uh, slow lorises with being a social primate, use their venom to play. With each other kind of can you describe that process and kind of how they how they do that yeah, it's not really using their venom they do something particularly weird and we're just about to submit a paper about this as well so they they're very territorial primates they live in family groups it's unusual for a nocturnal primate to live in family groups um normally they're that they are very solitary whereas lorises have mama daddy so male and female adults and up to four offspring. Nor normally there's three, there's almost always, once you've been together for a couple of years with your partner, you have a baby every year, right? So once you've had baby one, they often won't disperse till they're three years old. So then you have four babies in a social group. And we've looked at, and, and the adults play with the young ones, including the fathers play extensively with the young ones, which is rare in nocturnal primates. And in fact, males playing with the young ones is rare even in monkeys. Um, and then you get offspring playing with each other. And so the way that lorises bite each other, so we have a lot of evidence that the main function for their venom is actually interspecific competition. So they're very, very territorial. They live in these family groups. The females are incredibly territorial, like the females maintain their home ranges for years, and they have kind of territorial battles with neighbors. And this leads to a huge percentage of the population having horrendous wounds through fights. Uh, and this is most common during dispersal. So when the young ones are dispersing, they get even more wounds because they're trying to find that territory that they're going to keep for several years. So we have hypothesized that play is an important way to practice for this because the playing behavior is very identical to the fighting behavior. And it's this weird thing where lorises hang upside down, they put their arms above their heads and they clasp their hands over each other and they make a hood above their head, which puts their brachial gland right in contact with their mouth so they can combine saliva with the brachial oil. And they open their mouth and they make like a, either a really aggressive face or a play face. So when they're playing with each other, they'll be playing. But when they fight with each other, it's this very similar like position and it's a very similar position of the brachial gland and the saliva but then it's vicious and nasty so um the incredible amount of play that we see unusually for this kind of species uh happening to look exactly like the same positions they use for fighting made us believe that it's like a way to practice to do that fighting in the future that's that's quite interesting um that they that they have very similar Kind of very similar postures, but for both, and it is it, it, it's quite interesting to, as you say, that uh, a nocturnal primate is is showing these behaviours and, and doing these behaviours within the family group. So, kind of, what are the the injuries that they get from from the bites from these playing sessions or or the or the fighting for territory that they do? Um, how how do they go down? Kind of, how are these injuries manifest themselves? So normally when they're playing, they don't get the injuries. So that's kind of how we feel like they're learning how not to hurt each other. But when they fight, one of the most common wounds is a head wound. So they, they really bite the forehead off another animal or they'll bite the other animal's eye. And um, 
you'll have these horrendous facial wounds. Uh, we've had animals bite the ear off another animal. They can bite fingers and toes off each other. Um, they often grab each other's hands and feet, trying to knock each other out of a tree. And yeah, so what else do we have? Yeah, facial wounds, head wounds, and loss of ears and digits are the main ones. And, and I, I think uh, this it, kind of goes to show that these uh, people that are using these animals for these uh, photo opportunities and as pets that actually they're not cute and fluffy. They are uh, rather, as most primates are, an aggressive animal. But uh, if you corner it or whatever, it is going to, to posture and such forth. Which I think most people have seen the, the famous video of a loris being tickled and it picks its arms up. I think that is a, is that a threat display for yeah, them. So the venom pose like that's it's a very weird thing to do lemurs don't do that they're closely related to lorises bush babies don't do it it's a and the only other primate other than humans that puts their arms above their head that way is a chimp and they do it for grooming but with lorises it's just so weird like they the minute you you want to like measure a loris to put a radio collar on they they fling their arms above their head and press press it really really hard and you can't even pull their arms apart from each other because they this, this is, I think, also what, like they get these head wounds, so they're also protecting their head from head wounds. But it's a very weird thing. And, and back in 1904, I think it was, there was a guy working with this slender loris, which is similar to this little loris. And he described, described that position in the slender loris. And he saw its shadow against the wall, and he couldn't distinguish it from a cobra with its hood out. Because the loris has extra vertebra in its spine and a long, slim body, and then it puts this weird hood above its head, and it literally waves side to side. So it can do it upright, or it could do it upside down. And it, it sways its body, and then it strikes and goes... <laughs> it hisses at you. And uh, this particular guy, back in the early 1900s, who had kept many cobras, said he couldn't even distinguish the sound of the loris from the cobra. And so it's a very interesting and peculiar thing for a primate to do. There's no other primate that does that. Is there any other um, behavior that would go to show the animals um, having kind of markings, colorations um, that indicate they are venomous? You've already mentioned making the position of a cobra. That's, that's quite an impressive one in itself. Um, is there any markings on the animals themselves, like um, bright colors or something, that would let other animals in their ecosystem know? So, um, again, weirdly enough, lorises do, they have a face mask and they also have a stripe down their back. And the stripe down their back, um, when you see them doing that swaying movements or when you see them on the ground, it really can look like a snake. It's amazing because it's quite a, a wide stripe and, it, and it's supine. It's like an S shape, so it slithers. And uh, that stripe in some species disappears during parts of the year um, where it is warmer and wetter and there are more leaves and they are less exposed. They lose their stripe seasonally, which is crazy. Um, and, and potentially if it is a kind of mimicry with cobras or, or a kind of mimicry, like a background uh, dividing the animal in two. So say when it's feeding on gum on a tree, its body is divided by the stripe and you don't see it, but you don't need to waste energy on that stripe during the wet season when you're all covered with leaves. So there's the stripe. The facial mask, we've done some research on and we published a paper recently looking at the ontogenetic changes in the face mask because the baby's face or the younger animal's face masks are even more dramatically different than the adults so much that they used to be called a different species. Um, so the babies are really, really fluffy and they're extremely black and white. And as they get older, they get browner. And the extreme period of looking really black and white and contrasting is again at the period when they're dispersing. So once you disperse from your natal range and you tend to settle for up to eight years or nine years, we know an animal could settle for, because my study is now nine years long. Um, yeah, so they could potentially settle for their whole life once they get a territory, so then maybe they don't need to invest in that color coloration. But uh, definitely they have this incredibly contrasting color it's not color, it's a contrasting black and white that you can see from a distance. And we're pretty sure at least other lorises see it from a distance and potentially other um, animals see it as a warning signal as well. 
And if you compare the face mask of the Loris with uh, the spectacled cobra, they're very, very similar. And if you compare the back markings of the Loris with the cobra, where the cobra has the hood with the black and white markings on the front and the back, it, it's really incredible how much the Loris looks like a cobra. And that's that's really quite interesting because as you say, you say, another animal sees it from behind and it, it makes it out to be a cobra, that they may stay away be, knowing what would come if they were to interact with that. But with these markings on their back that breaks them up within tree tree lines and such forth, does that make it harder to, to spot them when you are trying to find individuals in the wild? Oh, they're very, very hard to see. They're very cryptic. They're, they blend in very well with the background. And it's interesting because if you see a loris go to the ground, um, like an open agricultural field, you would think it's very easy to see it, but it just sort of, it, it can disappear very quickly. So they're very good at being camouflaged, especially for we humans who don't have very good night vision. I think they are pretty good at hiding because they're quiet as well and they don't leap or jump. And, um, so their main form of kind of anti-predator behavior is definitely their crypsis. Do you think that your research will lead to um, other studies in uh, species of primate that are quite close to lorises um, or other cryptic mammals um, to see if there is this same relationship um, that you see within the loris? Um, or do you think it is quite specialized to, to just lorises? What's interesting is I studied lorises for many years, just their behavioral ecology, and I, I'd seen this re funny old research paper in a book chapter about them being venomous, and there was an early paper in the 70s about someone getting anaphylactic shock. And when you're working on mammals, most people go, oh, there are no venomous mammals. <laughs> and it, it's crazy. The loris can't be venomous, or it can't even be toxic, or it can't even give a painful bite, right? All of these things. And so... What we started looking at um, were other animals that were standout in their group that have unusual startle behaviors or aposomatic signaling or who have myths and stories surrounding them. Um, so I and actually there's some suggestion that early mammals were venomous, <clears throat> that they developed other strategies like teeth and claws to not need venom anymore. But when we look at certain um, teeth of early mammals, there are suggestions they may have been venomous. Uh, so it's, and it, it's something that a lot of people studying mammals don't think about. So I feel like we might find more venomous taxa or more toxic taxa. So maybe animals that sequester toxins from food and have some sort of a, a toxic reaction to the environment. And it's something we've been collecting a lot of data on and we have a couple of species in mind we're particularly keen to look at. And uh, I think they would be good candidates to potentially show some interesting, at least biochemical behaviors. Is there, uh, in the wild, is there actually any mimics of loris with people knowing that, well, with animals knowing that they are venomous? Is there any other animals that mimic this, the mimic lorises? No, there's no other mammals that mimic lorises. I, I think, if anything, lorises might mimic cobras, but not the other way around. Mimicry is pretty rare, and it's pretty rare in mammals. Um, so if there if there is mimicry with cobras, it's super cool, but it's it also might just be a super cool story. <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but there's what's interesting, though, is that cobras and lorises arrived in Asia at the same time in the Miocene, when the forests were shrinking because the environment got really cooler then and so you had animals having to go to the ground that were dedicated tree specialists and we know from the fossil record that lorises were already slow climbing so if they suddenly arrive into asia and they have to go to the ground all the time um there's a lot of there was a lot of evolutionary pressures at the time also maybe becoming gum specialists so eating gums which changes the the, the structure of your saliva uh, in order to eat really toxic gums and to give you a niche that no one else has. So there were a lot of interesting selection pressures at that particular time that could have made all of this crazy stuff happen. That's actually really quite interesting because um, evolutionary biology is not particularly uh, a strong point of mind. So actually hearing how, how lorises may have come about is actually is quite interesting. So I think uh, one thing that people will ask uh, from this episode is how do they get involved in the little fire? little fireface projects because 
I know that you do have a shop, and there's other ways to get involved as well, as you've already mentioned. Right, so we, I, a little, because of COVID-19, certain things are closed down at the moment, um, but normally we have an Etsy shop, so we have candy crafts from the village uh, that we sell on our Etsy shop, and we're hopefully soon going to be selling our amazing um, wildlife-friendly coffee and possibly some other kind of wildlife-friendly products. We do have a volunteer program. Um, it's a little bit different than it used to be because rules in Indonesia have changed. So people have to dedicate a slightly longer time and go on a research permit. And so it tends to be more for people who want to do some sort of research. Um, but we do allow tourists to come to our site as well. So if people just want to come and see slow lorises and, and the income from tourism helps the project as well. So there's the tourism aspect. People could do masters or bachelors or even PhD research at our site. Um, we have lots of animals other than slow lorises there, especially some very cool like flying dragons and fanged frogs. And um, we had uh, someone out looking at our Sicilians, which you might know Simon Maddox was there. Yep. So lots of reptiles and amphibians that could be studied as well. And we're doing some interesting work with insects at the moment um, related to how they they improve with organic agriculture. Uh, so yeah, so they can write to us at our website. We have, uh, it's littlefireface.org or nocturama.org. And we're info at littlefireface.org is the email. And they can ask to volunteer or they could follow any of the links. And also, for example, like if anyone's ever interested, we have lots of pictures of reptiles and amphibians, which I assume more people listen to your podcast are interested in and helping us to identify the species we have in our site. It's really cool as well. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of stuff that could be done. Yeah, I think the uh, Java is a bit of a hotbed for uh, for wildlife, and I think people can, as you say, that there's probably more animals in your research areas that uh, that people just either don't know about or there's very little research done in that done on them. So being able to join up with yourself and in your areas to to do some research on some other very cool animals that are out there it would be uh, quite interesting to see what comes from that yeah yeah so is there any future projects that you've got that uh coming up that that would be quite interesting oh gosh um at the moment one of the things we're doing is uh putting these little devices on our slow lorises they're called three axis accelerometers and um where we are looking at animals at Sheldon Wildlife Trust in Devon, and we're seeing exactly what the animals do every second and looking at the behavioral signatures. So therefore, at night, in the times we can't see them, like when they're deep in the bamboo, hopefully by using accelerometers, we'll be able to fill a huge gap about um, their behavior. So that's really cool because it, accelerometers, uh, that technology often doesn't work with mammals who like to rip them off don't wear them very well so loris is very tolerant of wearing them so that's fun so we're also oh sorry so how do you actually so I, I'm, I'm diverting a little bit from the question but how do you keep an accelerometer on, on a on a loris is oh, it they, similar to how with like a tracking collar where it'll just get added to the collar or? yeah so they wear a tracking collar and it, you just add it it adds about nine grams extra and it also has a temperature logger on there so we're going to look more about the details of their torpor which will be fun and relating that to some of the the behavioral data one of the things now that the study is nine years on we're looking a lot into all about their reproduction and their how how their babies grow and how long they keep them and how they disperse and where they go and that, that's also something that's um, important and we're also going to be comparing a bit more to a lowland forest one of the last lowland forests in java which is only 600 hectares the size of 600 football pitches and Loris has happened to live there, and it, and they've never been studied in a lowland forest because there's virtually none left. So we're going to be comparing to that area as well. That'll be really interesting to see the differences between the highland and the lowland areas, and see what see what differences you find from the same species within, if they are the same species within those uh, within those areas. That'd be really good. Yeah. So I think that's a really really good place to for us to, for us to end this episode. So thank you, Anna, for coming on so much and. Uh, sorry so much for coming on it's been really really interesting to hear about different animals than what we normally talk about and and understand a very brief high level of of lorises in in the wild so thank you so much for coming on 
Yeah, and thank you for having me, and I hope uh, someone will get interested in slow lorises. I, I hope so, and hopefully we'll continue to see your research um, carrying on at Venom Day through the years and stuff with as we attend and, and bits and pieces and see, see bits and pieces online as well from this, because it's really interesting. It's really interesting to see about and hear about a, a venomous mammal when all we tend to hear about is venomous insects and, <laughs> and reptilians. It's quite interesting to all and birds and fish, but to, to actually go into a mammal is quite, quite interesting in itself. So thank you so much for coming on and giving us a, and, and talking to us today. So mm. I'd just like to thank our listeners once again for tuning in to the latest episode of Word on Snakevine. Please do remember that uh, that we have a website for all our past and previous episodes of wordonthesnakevine.co.uk and there is merchandise available on there. All merchandise uh, uh, sales go straight back into snakebite based research and, uh, and initiatives and we'd just like to thank everybody once again. Thank you so much for listening. Good night.